It seems that Hitler's architect and armaments minister didn't only seek spiritual comfort. The confines of the monastery walls reminded him of the prison that was his home for 20 years. When he came to the monastery, it was a little bit of a memory of Spandau. In his own biography, he writes that he had this dream that he returns to Spandau and that the prison director welcomes him at the door and says, nice that you've come back home. The Allied prison at Berlin Spandau was where he wrote much of the material for the books that would make him a wealthy man. Although the war was over, he had escaped with his life and a hidden treasure of around 30 valuable paintings he acquired from dubious Nazi dealers. They were safely deposited in a Hamburg bank under the name of his trustee, Robert Frank. He wrote to another Speer confidant, two thirds of the pictures are stolen property. We have had great problems with these things because a part was Jewish property. Yours, Robert Frank. Stuck in his prison cell, Albert Speer was powerless to retrieve the paintings that he had desperately rescued in the last days of the war. He wrote to his solicitor, following my release, I fear there will be a public reaction should I attempt to regain ownership of a valuable collection of paintings. Yet despite the risk of a stolen art scandal, Albert Speer sold his story in print and on television around the world. He seemed to enjoy the spotlight and his popular role as a reformed Nazi. His international fame gave West Germans a representative figure, someone they could point to as uh, symbolic of how the German people had been exploited by the madman Hitler, that their, their brilliance and their talents had been put to ill uses, that they now recognised that and felt very sorry about it, but that it was, it was time to move on, that it was all in the past, and the best storyteller of that past was Albert Speer. You know that the final solution was a secret, and it was a secret to me too. I was not informed what was going on in this way, but I had a certain feeling that something is going on, a certain uncertainty. I have always with me this traumatism uh, of the extermination of the Jews, will, which will never leave me. Quite often I was uh, uh, thinking that uh, I never shall get rid of it, that this burden will ever last with me. But he could not bring himself to admit involvement in the concentration camps. It tells us he's a master of adaptation, that, that he's chameleon-like, that he's, uh, he's more than an opportunist, though he is that. Um, he is someone who, who can reinvent himself uh, as is necessary. His constant reinventions and public expressions of remorse took a toll on a key friendship forged in the Nazi era. In 1971, his friend and former comrade Rudolf Walters had had enough and wrote, Dear Albert, you don't cease to style yourself more and more radically as a criminal for whom 20 years imprisonment wasn't enough. May I suggest that we only see each other again when this phase has finished? That means when you are no longer exclusively interested in your rehabilitation, your old R. Once the second most powerful man in Germany, Albert Speer cut a lonely figure. He had a cold marriage. Um, I don't get the impression he had any, any real good friends, you know, um, so he didn't need passionate love with women. He didn't seem to need strong friendship with men. Uh, so he was a loner. He was a loner. The family home in Heidelberg seemed to offer little comfort for the former Nazi supremo. I entered the house. It was like a ghost house. 
the feeling that nobody lives here. I met his wife twice in passing, but I was never introduced to her. It was not a warm home. Although he was a father to six children, Albert Speer looked for intimacy outside his own family. At the end of the 1970s, Speer admitted to his wife Margarete that he was having an affair. That really must have been a terrible blow for his wife. And it's typical Speer again. He feels love and once again he is the center of attention. He doesn't take any consideration for the people who have been at his side all this time. In public, he made statements about burdens and traumas about his Nazi past. In private, he enjoyed an affair with a German-English married woman half his age. His hidden art collection, amassed from Nazi dealers during the war, was another secret. About 30 paintings had been hidden and stored by Speer's old family friend and trustee, Robert Frank. When Frank died, the paintings ended up in a garage near the German city of Bonn. They agreed to a discreet 50-50 split. Albert Speer wanted to remain anonymous. At that time, many dealers and buyers didn't ask too many questions about where such art had come from. Any more than from 1933 until well, into the 1990s, there was a roaring trade in works of art, the uh, provenance or origins of which uh, no one cared uh, to check about uh, too much uh, because many of the dealers probably knew that these works of art had at some point been stolen, looted, or had been obtained through forced sales by Jews desperate to escape from the Third Reich. At that time, in 1981, the dubious provenance of Speer's paintings could be hidden or ignored. In the catalogue, the owner was simply listed as private. The name of the previous seller, Hitler's notorious art buyer and dealer Karl Haberstock, was also left out. There is no doubt that Speer was supplied with art that was looted from uh, Jewish dealers, Jewish collectors. He was supplied with these works of art by Karl Haberstock, who was one of the great plunderers of stolen and looted art. Regardless of their provenance, the anonymous owner, the war criminal Albert Speer, was about to make another fortune from his Nazi past. The paintings were sold off gradually at the auction house in Cologne, and after each sale, their anonymous owner would collect cash payments. No receipts, no signatures, no evidence. The total sum was something like one million Deutschmark. I have no idea what happened to all that money. Later on, his widow asked, are there no proceeds left? And we answered, no, it's all been paid out. We have the confirmation here. And somehow we could then explain it. It was another woman. We heard that he had a liaison in England. Once again, it had all worked out for Hitler's former favorite. His girlfriend lived in London, so when the BBC flew him in for a TV interview, Albert Speer combined business with pleasure. Speer certainly played the media game. Uh, I mean, he ended up appearing on TV programs all over the world, and, and in fact, he died in the United Kingdom when he was over here for an interview. Ironically, his last interview was about looted Nazi art and Hitler's fantasy capital he helped design. He was a daydreamer, and when he, when, for instance, such a, such a model, when he saw it, he was full of uh, enthusiasm, and he forgot maybe all his political problems. Meeting up with his lover in the British capital that his former boss set out to destroy, the 76-year-old could maybe forget his problems. But the London liaison would be his last. The man who kept the Nazi war machine alive died from a brain hemorrhage. 
his girlfriend was by his side. This is obviously, at any rate at the beginning, a happy accident for him. And uh, one could say, I hope without sounding too cynical, that it was a good way to go. Though not, of course, for the lady. But, um, you know, to, to have found something like that and then your life is over. It's not, not such a bad ending in, in cosmic terms. Uh, difficult in detail, but... It was a merciful death compared to the fate of his many victims in the slave labor camps. Once again, fate seemed to smile on the so-called good Nazi. Speer was guilty of numerous crimes. And furthermore, his deputy was hanged. Um, so it's obviously inconceivable <laughs> that, you know, that the boss might be excused uh, and the deputy hanged and punished in that way. So I think that Speer was an incredibly lucky man. Right up to the end, Hitler's protege managed to keep up his carefully crafted persona of the ignorant, innocent and decent man. That was Albert Speer's real life's work. He had the good fortune that a lot of the stuff that implicated him personally in the persecution of the Jews uh, did not emerge for many years. And when it did emerge, the facade began to crumble. A young PhD student, Matthias Schmidt, ultimately uncovered the Speer myth. It was the armament minister's former comrade, Rudolf Wolters, who helped reveal the true extent of his crimes, including proof of the so-called good Nazis' involvement in the displacement of the Berlin Jews. The figures were recorded in typical meticulous Nazi style. Altogether, 23,765 Jewish apartments were taken over. The number of resettled people was 75,000. Later, Albert Speer ordered Walters to strike out the records that implicated him in Nazi atrocities. I suggest that the relevant pages no longer exist. I read this and knew I'm on the trail of a gigantic forgery. I travelled to Berlin and started again from scratch. And that's when the new image of Speer emerged. It was clear. Albert Speer had started the redevelopment of Berlin into Hitler's vision Germania without any regard for the Jewish population it ultimately destroyed. Since his death, historians have come to understand that he played a key role in removing Berlin Jews from their home uh, in the late 1930s and during the war, uh, and that the general building inspector, the General Bau Inspection, uh, displaced thousands of Berlin Jews who were deported and, for the most part, killed. And uh, I always think of that as the first station on a railway line that ends up in Auschwitz when the Jews were kicked out of where they lived. Echipa de depanare s-a întors.